Okay, guys. So today we are excited to have our friend Cameron Huddleston, who is with us. And JJ, she has quite the confession. True, very true. She will be sharing the good, the bad, and the ugly with respect to caregiving. I think we all can relate. But like all of us, you know, honestly, Cameron has been a caregiver, but she's so much more than that. She's pretty flipping amazing. And so, Jay, I want you to share with our friends, our listeners, um, a little bit about Cameron. You know, Natalie, I feel like we always start with like, we love our guests and we I, do I really love our wor- guests, you know, here's the deal. But I worry about that day when we say, I really don't like that guest, you know, so we got to be, oh my God, she sucks. This is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> We're so, terrible. We're sad you're here. I know. So sh- don't tell Cameron that. So no. <laughs> Cameron, we're we so glad you're Cameron. here. <laughs> so we uh, are so glad that Cameron is here. Seriously, it's true. Uh, Cameron, we met at the Care Colloquium back in November, and um, she, Cameron, you are truly a like-minded sister, is what we're going to call you, uh, yes. because we did not realize that we are almost the same in age. We're very young, and that we went you to are school very young. not like forty-five minutes away from each other. Oh, which was that's like, right. Yeah, total like surprise. Wait, I'm so, touching uh, my pearls because I, I think she went to W and L. She did. She yes, did. That's so watching really, for all you people who don't know what W L is. <laughs> so right up the street, Cameron is. Uh, she's an author. She's a speaker, and she's also an award-winning journalist with twenty years of experience writing about personal finance. So. So I know we're mm. all going to be able to learn a little bit about that. Hello. Um, okay. She wrote a book based on her experience uh, with her caregiving uh, with her mom. Um, her book is called Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk. And uh, it's about how to have essential conversations with your parents about their finances, because uh, finances in our family were taboo. Cameron, mm. we are. I'm glad that you're here today because we ask for uh, we ask people what they want to talk about on the show. And what we've gotten a lot is people that are what's known as a sandwich generation. So your mom was 65 and she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and you were how old? 35. And you had how many kids? kids at the time? At uh-huh. the time, I added another one because, yeah. you know, I didn't need any extra stress in my life, right? <laughs> Let's just totally add insane. another. What's another in a group of several? So, no, so and how, had, old were, how old were your girls? Two and four when wow. my mother was diagnosed. Wow. In wow. fact, one of the... One of the things I remember well is that we celebrated my second daughter's second birthday at my house and my mom was there. She celebrated with us. And then we went on a trip. Actually, we went to Michigan um, because one of their, one of my girls' babysitters was getting married and they were flower girls in the wedding. And we came back. So this was, I don't know, several weeks after my daughter's birthday, we come back and there's a sign on our door, on our front door that my mom had left that said, happy birthday, Zoe. And I was like, oh my gosh, my mother must have forgotten that we had celebrated my daughter's birthday. I, I, we had been seeing signs that there was, but there was not a diagnosis at that point and yeah. i was just like this is not good this is not yeah. good at all yeah so so that that helped get the ball rolling for yeah. her diagnosis um and the first doctor she saw i was not with her and so mm-hmm. she said that she was okay so mm-hmm. either she lied or the doctor didn't do a good job oh of, of testing her she just didn't tell the full truth i guess i don't know we could say. i don't yeah. know i really yeah. don't know i don't know and so when a friend of hers convinced her several months later to see another doctor mm-hmm. i went with her mm-hmm. okay time. all right there you go. and the doctor confirmed what i already knew that she yeah. had alzheimer's disease mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and that began my journey as yeah. a caregiver so she was still, I mean, I know she, she was showing the signs of course of Alzheimer's, but she was still living by herself. Yes. So still she in was. good health, basically. Yes. Great health. Great yeah. health. Mm. She, she and my father had gotten divorced when I was in college yeah. and actually my father had passed away when he was 61. 
Yeah. Um, and so my mom was, she was on her own. She was in great health. Like what well, she had, um, she picked up swimming. Like she was active when she was younger, but not as active when she was raising me and my sister. But she had been swimming for a few years. I mean, she was slim and she looked great. She mm. was a smoker when I was growing up and she had quit yeah. smoking when I was 18. So health wise, she was doing pretty well. And I wow. really never expected to have to care for my mom because she was doing so well and she was yeah. functioning independently great yeah wow so that feels good so as we're aging you can age well i mean sure. if you think about it you can clean up your health i mean the fact that your mom was swimming and things like that i'm like dude i should start swimming so yeah. so mm -hmm. so then she gets diagnosed go keep going jay so go ahead. well and my she gets diagnosed but you said she so she's living by herself the only thing that we've got then is just some cognitive decline so she stays in her house Cameron I mean she's mm -hmm. not you're not you've not moved her in and you're still able to kind of you're you're working right you have two littles you're working I'm working and you're and married so <laughs> I'm married <laughs> and yeah. so what I knew as a personal finance journalist yeah my first thought goes to the financial side of things in fact Absolutely. several years several years before she had this diagnosis I had a conversation with her about looking into long-term care insurance so she took wow. my advice and she did but she couldn't get coverage because of this other pre-existing condition that she had that yeah. made her too high risk okay um, she actually she had had this benign tumor behind her left ear it's called an acoustic neuroma and it had caused hearing loss and so that was why in the early stages of her memory loss it was easy for me to write off that memory loss as hearing loss oh, oh. she asked me a question again maybe she didn't hear my answer you oh. know, she's repeating herself when yeah you know because of the hearing loss so it yeah was easy to make excuses for her until there were things like you know, hanging up the sign saying happy birthday for my daughter, showing me this bench that she had bought on her porch, going back inside. And then a few minutes later, asking me if she wanted, if I wanted to see it, forgetting yeah. that we had just looked at it, you yeah. know, and so that was when it was obvious. And so she gets this diagnosis and I'm thinking, okay, we've got to get her in to meet with an attorney to update all of her legal documents, because yeah. I knew that I was going to have to step in and manage her finances for her. Okay. I was going to have to help manage her medical care and so that meant she needed to name me her power of attorney i needed to be named her health care proxy the will needed to be updated and so we did that we met with an attorney she was still competent enough to mm -hmm. sign those documents she knew what she was doing um i was named her financial power of attorney her health care power of attorney uh my sister was too but you know, fortunately, the the attorney had and my mom, I guess, had the foresight to grant us the power to act independently of each other, which is right. really important. Is that important. sounds Very that's important. something. So that sounds like a tidbit. You can it's both you. So JJ and I technically could be as uh, uh, be able to <laughs> give permission without one another. I like the uh, the independent of one another because right. yes, I'm sure that you've probably seen or heard of siblings not getting along and. And then you get in the stalemate if all parties have to agree. Right. Sure. Okay, so that's I think something a lot to of, think about. It is. A lot of attorneys would actually say, really, you shouldn't name more than one person. Like you have your primary and then there's a backup. But if you're going to name more than one person, which a lot of parents want to do that, they don't want to mm -hmm. show favoritism mm -hmm. and you're not. Yeah. It's not, wow, pick me, yeah. pick me to be your power of attorney. I really yeah. want to do that. Um, <laughs> I'm pointing don't, at JJ. Now don't everybody feel insulted. Else, don't everybody feel insulted else declined that job, Cameron. <laughs> Nobody all, else wanted we the job. Put our finger to our nose and said, "Oh, not it." <laughs> JJ yeah. was slow to do it. <laughs> so, so. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question though, Cameron, because you've done, you know, you've got this situation, and it's a personal situation for you. But you've been in finance. You've done all this writing for so many right. years. In for us and for so many members of our family. Talking about finances, especially as family members have grown older, it is you do not talk about it. It's like you're nosy. You're you're kind of oh, I'm just waiting. You know, you're you're implying that you're What's waiting for the them to die. For um, how I mean, how did you do that? Was this an uncomfortable topic for you and your mom, or was it something that your family's comfortable with? I mean, how do you how do you get to that point? I, I, being raised in the South, mm -hmm. I was taught that you don't talk about money. That oh, is my father, 
my father instilled that in me you yeah. don't talk about money it's mm -hmm. impolite don't ask people about how much they make don't ask them how much they spent on things so my dad was hush hush about okay money. my mother didn't she didn't seem to be so tight-lipped about mm -hmm. money Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the lessons I learned about money, about managing money, came really from watching her. She was a stay at home mom. And so I would watch her, you know, do the grocery shopping with the money that she had, you know, and, and being frugal. And she was always very good at managing mm -hmm. money. Like she okay. could, and I'm so grateful for that because she did inherit money from her parents and she could have blown it, but she didn't. And that money mm -hmm. is what help pay for her care because like I said, she couldn't get long-term care insurance. Right. I wasn't afraid to talk to her. Yeah. I never had those conversations with my dad. And as I mentioned, he died at 61. And my dad, even though he was an attorney, died without a will in a second oh, marriage. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So that's what, you know, I wrote the book because I realized we don't want to have those conversations. We, we don't, don't think have them until it's too late. And it is so important. And you want to have these conversations before there's that health emergency or a financial emergency, because if yeah. you wait for the emergency, emotions are running high. True. Absolutely. You're not 100%. thinking rationally. You're pointing fingers. And really, that's the last thing someone wants to talk about at the time of an emergency. So you're going to start easing your way into these conversations while your parents are relatively young and healthy. And it's yeah. not... Do you have a will and what am I getting? Because then, of course, you're going to look nosy. Exactly. And if you know that the topic of death scares your parents, then don't oh, yeah. start by asking them about their will. What does retirement look like for you? Or how is retirement going for you if they're already retired? Uh, you know, what are you planning on doing in retirement? Keep it really general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're talking to them about something like scams because we can all be targeted by scammers. Hey, have you heard about this scam? There's this new scam going around where people are calling up and claiming to be with the Social Security Administration. Mm -hmm. And they're claiming that you've got to apply for your cost of living adjustment. And they're really just trying to get your personal information. Um, and this is an actual scam that's happening right now. Yeah. So wow. Talking about scams is a great way to introduce the idea of talking about money so you find your way in mm. and you or you ask them for advice about your own yeah. financial situation yeah hey um you know i just got married should i have life insurance now do i need a will oh do you happen to have a will where is it located where can i find it if something happens use a story you know or hey i was listening to this podcast about caregiving and i realized i've never talked to you about what sort of care you might want if you need yeah care. And I want to know because I want to know what your wishes are. And it's all about making your parents know that you want to know what their wishes are, that you're looking out for their well-being. You don't want to come off looking greedy. You certainly don't want to come off looking condescending by saying, you know, yeah. hey, I don't think you've done a good job of saving for retirement and I'm afraid oh, I'm yeah. going to have to take care of you. Or I don't yeah. want to have to take care of you when you get older. That yeah. I think it's mostly I don't want to have to take care of you when you get yeah. older. That's the way it's going to right. come across. Right, and you might not. Yeah, and you really might not. And you're like, so you're saying, right. right. So <laughs> well, you're saying to them instead, if you need care, what sort of care do you want? If you want to stay in your house, is your house set up for you to age in place? If you need to hire someone to help out, is there money there? to do it. So you're asking yeah. those questions. You're getting your parents to think about it because they might not want to think about it or they might no. never have thought about it. So you plant those seeds. Right. And right. it's a series of conversations. Right. Look, right. I just do threw wait. my hand up, Jay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> no, look at her. I, look at this. Like, oh, I've got a question. Nobody can see that I have a hand clapper that is like, oh, it, <laughs> she it says a double duty. Like, we have all I, these ideas for camera. We're like, but what about this camera? But, but wait, what? <laughs> so here's the question, though, because I totally jumped in on you, and I saw. I'm sorry for that, Cameron. Do did you write the book after your mom or after your dad? I wrote the book in. 2018 and uh -huh. it was published in 2019. So my father had already passed away. He died in 2001. My mother had already been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and I had been caring for her. She was in the memory care facility at that point, but she was still alive. My mother passed away in January of 2021. Okay. So, so I was, I sense. was still in it. I was still yeah. involved very mm -hmm. involved with managing my mom's finances. At that point, I was managing her finances entirely and overseeing her care. So, and then you thought, 
in my free time, I'll write a book about this, about managing your money. Cause it's true because I'm sitting there like, cause that's the part that the reason I wanted to ask, because I'm like, Ooh, do you felt like you waited too late to have that conversation with your mom for yourself? Yes. Yes. That, that's what I knew. I had a and I point that, that out. I, I point that late. out in the book and I say, you know, I, I don't do what I do. Okay. Yeah. Do what I say, not what I do. And I made the mistake <laughs> of waiting. I did. And I, I yeah. admit that I made yeah. the mistake. And as a result of making that mistake, like I said, I had to scramble to meet with that attorney with my mom to get those legal documents in place so that I would have the legal right to manage her finances for mm. her once she wasn't able to. I had to play detective to get details about her finances as she was forgetting those details. She had an account that slipped under my radar because I had not sat down with her and gone through to discuss every account she had and get, you know, do that forensic accounting. Yeah. Um, so there was this account that I didn't even know existed until mm. She was in a memory care facility and there were letters being sent about inactivity in this account and it was going to be turned over to the state as an unclaimed asset. And I was like, oh, wait, 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 what is this account? $50,000 in the account. It was almost oh. turned over to the state as an unclaimed asset Wow! because I didn't even know it existed. No, yeah. that's a hard no to the state. We already paid taxes on that too. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm right. not giving more to the state. Uh, sorry, Kentucky. It's not happening. So, so <laughs> So if I had had these conversations while she before there was any sort of memory loss, if we had gone over yeah. all of her assets, you know, yeah. had that conversation like the perfect time would have been after she couldn't get long term care insurance. OK, mom, right. let's sit down and talk about what would happen if you need a care. How would you how are we going to go about paying for that care? What sort of care do you want? And we could have made that list of all our assets and figured yeah. it out um, instead. You know, I almost lost fifty thousand dollars of her money. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and yeah. and that's and that goes fast. I I mean, I think about you know, um, a mom is in um, a day program which we love, but that's and that's an inexpensive one. I mean, thirty dollars a day, and if we we want mom to be able to go every day, but some of them are a lot more, way more expensive than that. And then when you add on uh, individuals who come and do respite, people who want to come in and provide support that that money goes pretty fast and i know cameron we had talked in another conversation about how you really work to manage that and so my question i think some of our listeners might be like well i mean i don't i mean i use my checkbook and i balance it <laughs> i'm not what if i'm not a professional i feel intimidated by the numbers how am i going to to kind of spend the money as wisely as i can do i have to be a professional should i hire somebody or can i really do this on my own it is a challenge okay. um, most of us do not have the financial know-how and that's by no fault of our own. We're not taught this in school. We're mm -hmm. not taught it in high school. We're not taught it in yeah. college yet. We're expected to figure out on our own how to, you know, create a budget and stick to a budget and um, not rack up too much debt. And then what to do once you have that debt and how to get a mortgage and how to pay your taxes. And so most of us are yeah. barely even managing to stay on top of our own finances. If you've got to handle someone else's, especially someone who is older and might mm -hmm. be getting government benefits that you have no experience with social security right. medicare or if they're getting medicaid it's it's all so confusing but that doesn't mean that you should throw up your hands and say i can't do this okay right? but you are going to have to do now is educate yourself mm -hmm. and there are lots of free resources out there the oh. consumer financial protection board cfpb mm -hmm. has guides on managing someone else's money mm. talk to your parents bank Go to the bank and say, you know, hey, help me out here. You know, help me, you know, get a handle on what sort of accounts my mom has. You know, you show up with that power of attorney document and let the bank mm -hmm, know yeah. I am my mom's power of attorney. She is, has this health issue or she has cognitive decline. I need to get involved. Um, there are financial advisors. Certainly you can hire and you can maybe hire right. one who will work with you for just an hour or two. You can pay an hourly fee. Um, you know, and they can help you sit down with you and your parent. Yeah. There are also financial advisors who will do pro bono work. You want to reach mm. out to your state chapter of the Financial Planning Association and ask, mm. hey, do you have any members 
who will do some pro bono work or who might do, you know, provide some help for a reduced fee. Mm. That's one option. Uh, You know, reaching out to your um, local area agency on aging Mm -hmm. and getting them to point you to resources in your community. Like I mentioned, there's lots and stuff of lots of information available on the web, you know, just do a Google. How do I file a tax return for my parent? How do I, you know, what do I need to know about Medicare? Um, What do I need to know about power of attorney? What do I need, you know, should I have a joint bank account with my parent? You do a search and you're gonna find some information. You just wanna make sure that that information comes from a reputable Mm, source. Good point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point, not the Nadle Bank and Trust. That's so, exactly right. That, yeah, that's why I know. handle the finances, yeah. Cameron. That's why I handle the finances. So, Cameron, you're like a wealth of financial knowledge. I know, so, right? I mean, she's got like I, so much nuggets, I but I'm going to steer us back towards caregiving, Jay. I, well, I know. And so she's got, because I know that with all that knowledge, you were, your mom went through, I know that you had her, she, she was able to stay at her home for a while. Yeah. And, but eventually you guys went through a couple of different levels of care and ultimately she ended up in memory care. Um, But you're still, you're doing all of this, which amazes me. And you're writing a book. And raising some small people. Small people. And then having another person. You're, you're adding a, a child whole to other that. person yeah, at some point in addition in there, to doing those things. At some Jay. point in there, you added another child. But tell me about that, how that for your, as you are taking care of your mom, share just a little more about that journey for you. Yeah. Um, how that, how that was for you, your work life, Personally. your personal life. Exactly. Tell us a little more about you. Cause we know you took care of the finances, sister. I mean, you're you taking had everybody cover. and their brother. Chuck. Yeah, I did. Um, it was a lot. It was a whole lot. I, so for the first two years after my mom was diagnosed, she yeah. stayed in her house yeah. and uh, my husband pitched in. He was in charge of a lot of the maintenance work around the house, mowing yeah. her yard, fixing things. Mm-hmm. I was there frequently checking in on her. I took the car keys away, but when I did that, I hired a college student to drive her so that she wouldn't be trapped at home. So I'm going to take her on errands. And then that lasted for a little while before I actually replaced her with a woman who was closer to her age, who had some experience working in adult daycare because it felt more like hanging out with a friend. Okay. Mm. All right. And so, but then I realized it wasn't safe for my mom to stay at home after she got a scam call and was almost Mm. scammed um, and actually had called my uncle asking how to wire money. My uncle calls me and says, Oh my gosh. I think your mom's being scammed. So I rushed over to her house. Oh my gosh. Sat with her answering the phone, intercepting this call, because she believed that she had won some sort of sweepstakes and she had to wire money to get the prize. And I was like, no, mom, no, mom, someone's trying to take advantage of you. So I sat there and I kept answering the phone and and like hanging up and hanging up and don't call back and don't call back. But then I had to go pick up my kids. So I had to call one of her friends to come and stay with her for the rest of the day to make sure she wasn't going to get back Mm. on the phone with that guy. And that was a wake up call to me. She can't be at home alone anymore. And it was also, yeah. it was getting too much for her to take care of her house. She wasn't doing a good job of feeding herself anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I was fortunate. We had this large older home that had apartments in it that we were renting out. Covers half of our mortgage, right? Being financially Perfect. savvy here. <laughs> and so when someone had moved out, I was like, this is a perfect time to move my mom in. She still gets her own space. Right. And I sold it to her like, you know what, mom, this is a great way for you to hang out with your grandkids more. Oh, that's and savvy. I like it. That's good. And not, that's, a, not, that's not even a lie. Right. Not mom, you can't take care of yourself anymore. But mom, I think this would be a great idea. Yeah. Smaller space to take care of. You're with me. You're with the grandkids. You can help me in my yard, but you'll still have your own space, your own little balcony where you can put plants out there. And it was hard though. It was really, it was really hard. Um, and unfortunately she had some friends who weren't very helpful, who didn't like the idea that I was moving her and made it yeah. difficult for me and made me feel very guilty about doing it. But mm. I had to tell myself, this is best for my mom and I have to do what's best for her. And That's I right. was trying to stretch her financial resources that she had as far as possible, knowing that she was young and this was a long journey that we were heading on and this was only the beginning and so yeah 
so there I was like every morning I would get up and I would go upstairs and I would make sure she was eating breakfast and I would give her her medicine. And then I hired a caregiver um, through an agency to be with her on the weekdays while I was working. And then in the evening, she would either eat dinner with us or I would take dinner to her. I would make sure she was taking her medicine on the weekends. I was with her a lot. And after about two years, um, it was apparent to me that I, I couldn't keep doing that. At the end of the day, I was exhausted. I was stressed out. And that stress would often come out on my kids, not that I wasn't yelling at my kids, but I wasn't being the best mom that I could mm -hmm. be to my kids. I, you know, I didn't have the patience for, and, and I couldn't be the best mom that they needed me to be. Right. And I couldn't be the best caregiver that my mom needed me to be. Uh, there were issues like I could hear her wandering around at night and I was oh. afraid. What if she wanders off at night? Mm. What if she falls at night? You can't lock her in the apartment. That's, that's dangerous. She almost set her apartment on fire because she left a tea kettle on left yeah. the forgot yeah. about it left it and it was a christmas time and she took my cousin and his wife up to see her apartment and they discovered the tea kettle was on and i was like oh my gosh our house almost that's the down. decision made right there cameron for me it's like okay we're gonna have to change up this scenario so so yeah so i there were just so many things telling yeah. me yeah i i couldn't handle it anymore i couldn't handle yeah. it on my own she needed round the clock care absolutely and I just wasn't capable of providing that on my own while yeah. working and taking care of young kids. Um, and so, yes, while she was living with me, though, I actually I did get pregnant with my third child, my son. <laughs> yeah. Because my husband and I had wanted to have three kids. And yeah. after our second child and my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, we were like, well, I guess we can't do this. But then she had had an issue where she was in the emergency room because her blood pressure spiked up really high. I was in that same hospital where I had my girls and I was like, oh my gosh, we really wanted that third kid. And so wow. <laughs> I'm sitting there looking at my mom in the hospital bed, but thinking, oh, we really, I really want a baby. <laughs> I really don't understand that, Cameron. And I, I don't know what's you, wrong with me. I don't <laughs> either, but I just want you to know you have more energy than everyone. So <laughs> that's like, I'm like sitting there thinking I would not, some days I didn't feel like breathing. Like I was like I'm too lazy to breathe today. I'm just going to put I, a mask over my face and let it do the work. So, I love that part of your story though, Cameron, because I would like to say we, if we could have callers, I'd say, if you were a caregiver and decided at the same time that you I'll wanted to a have a baby, baby, please call in and tell us how you did that. Not literally how you did it, but I mean, just saying, um, that is fantastic. We love so that. You decide. I know. Cause I, after being in the hospital, with my mom, I went back to my husband. And I was like, I don't know. What do you think? I feel like we're going to regret it. And they're like, well, let's try and see what happens. <laughs> and then it happened right away. And then we were like, oh my gosh. What have we done? What have we done? <laughs> you already had two, Cameron. You should have known. So I know I mean, it. Clearly, I know you were already it. fertile. And so, you know, <laughs> but whatever, you know, no worries. You're having a baby because that won't be remotely hard being fully pregnant going up and downstairs. So, and I had my son, um, you know, but it, my oldest daughter is my only child who ever knew my mom before yeah. while she was still her grandmother. You know, yeah. before she was really experiencing serious memory loss. Um, right. My middle child doesn't have any memory of my mother, her grandmother, without her being impacted by Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Um, yeah. And my son, you know, by the time he was born, um, and he's, there's a five year difference between my middle child and my son. Mm -hmm. And so um, by the time he was born, my, my mother, um, like sh she was so confused by this baby. Where did yeah. this baby come from? She, is it a boy? Is it a girl? Whose baby is this? Oh. But what's interesting is that my son, I feel like might have had the best relationship with my mother while she had Alzheimer's disease because he was always with me when I was visiting her in the memory care facility because he was the youngest one so he had yeah. to go along for the ride you know big sisters were doing their after school activities and so yeah. i pick him up from preschool 
whatever from kindergarten and we would go visit my mom mm -hmm. and i tell you what those ladies oh, at I bet they her memory care facility they would go crazy over him I bet. they just <laughs> loved having a cute little kid around and so did my mom <laughs> because she um after my parents got divorced she was a preschool teacher yeah. for a while and ah. so she, he just brought so much joy to yeah. her i was right. getting ready to say the word has to be joy yeah. and yes. And that keeps everybody that that stimulating to the brain too, like the, all that movement and the excitement and the facial expressions. I think there's something yeah. that stimulates the brain, especially. Absolutely. So, okay. So, Absolutely. oh, that's so interesting. Okay. All right. So having a baby was a good thing for you. All right. Okay. Yeah, we'll give you, we'll give you that. That's fine. So but what he I, I, was, but he, but I, I did, like I said, I moved her into memory care and hmm. I know people might think, Oh, well, you shouldn't have had a third kid. You could have taken better care of your mom or whatever. I mean, this was already in the works. Yeah. Like yeah, I, no. I wanted to keep her with me as long as possible, but there were just so many reasons why not just having a third kid, but just so many reasons why. And most important was her safety. And absolutely, it wasn't a safe situation for her because of that wandering. And I didn't want to be reactive. I didn't want to get a call from the police in the middle of the night saying we found your mom wandering yeah. the streets. Right. Um, but just because she was in memory care didn't mean I was off the hook. Right. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Absolutely. To say. So Not it, it sounds all. to me like you and and we had that experience with mom living in the assisted living facilities. Like we got calls. We, you know, we lived farther away. So we would have, we would engage even with family members who would go and check in on her. And of course you okay. throw COVID in on top of it and that's a hot mess. So talk a little bit about that. <sighs> So um, there were calls all the time. And the thing is, initially, she was in a memory care facility an mm -hmm. hour away from me because Ooh, there weren't right. any memory care facilities. And that's there right. is a big difference between memory care and assisted living. And if True. you have dementia, you need to be in a memory care facility. It's right. a special level of care. And so I was driving an hour back and forth to go to visit her, to check on her. And there were falls. And that meant being in the hospital and that meant transitioning to a skilled nursing facility for a little while for rehabilitation. Um, yeah. And it was, you know, it was, it was still a lot. And then when a facility did open up in my hometown and, you know, I gave it some time to see if it was going to be a good facility, I moved her back. Of course I could visit with her a lot more often, which was great. Um, but, you know, taking her to doctor's appointments, yeah. Oh my gosh. Like it taking her out of the facility was an absolute nightmare. Like when I was first, when she was first in a memory care facility and I would visit her, I would often take her out to eat, but it got to the point where I realized this is a mistake. Don't take her out of the environment where she feels secure. Taking to a restaurant is too overwhelming for her. Yeah. So I stopped taking her out. But when I had to take her, that facility had a doctor who partnered with it. And so would come and check on her. The facility in my hometown did not. So I had to take her to doctor's visits. Mm. Absolute nightmare, nightmare. Mm. Like mm. the first thing they would want to do is put that blood pressure cuff on her and take her blood pressure. Yeah. And she had no idea what was going on and she would get angry. And sometimes mm. she would be combative. She was so easygoing usually, like I was so lucky. My mom, her personality did not change with Alzheimer's disease. And mm. she was that always very easy going. Yeah. Um, just just always so lovely but if you did something that she didn't like she would let you know and even in the very late stages of alzheimer's disease when she could hardly communicate again if she was in a situation where she felt threatened even if there was no real threat but if she felt threatened she would let you know in very certain terms get off me leave me alone she spoke oh, wow. very clearly yes wow. <laughs> usually she could not put together a sentence but she could let you know to get away with her and it would yeah. usually be interlaced with expletives and i'm like what that's not my <laughs> Who mom <is> that? <laughs> oh yes that's really in the back of the filing cabinet so yeah. she's digging deep on that one so but you know memories are you know we have those memories and we know what our our body tells us what's a threat regardless if our memory remembers or not the the body remembers and i think it pulls from our catalog of memories that we have historically so that's interesting so it's interesting that you said um I had to stop taking her out to dinner kind of thing. Like I had to stop taking her out because that I wonder, and I don't know if that's true for you, but I wonder if that's more of, this is what I would want if I was in that case, 
versus this is what's best for her. Cause it sounds like you're saying I had to accept that I couldn't do that. That's something I can't do with her, but I can do this. So I think it's almost like a, a shift in what you're thinking. I can't do this because it doesn't, mom doesn't respond well to that. And so I'm going to choose to do this and be happy equally about that. Like Sue Ryan talks about that, accepting the people where they're at. I think this is a big mistake that caregivers make is that they, they think that they should keep things the same. Mm -hmm. because they think that is what their loved one wants, like taking them out to meals, taking them to their favorite place, having them in their home for holiday gatherings. Mm -hmm. But it's not always a good idea, especially if there is dementia. You know, yeah. putting them in a situation where there's lots of activity, lots of noise, it's overwhelming. Yeah. And they can just shut yeah. down. And so yes i had to accept that this is not this is not benefiting my mom to take yeah. her to a restaurant she's much better off staying in her facility and i know some people will think oh that's just awful you're not taking her out to do anything fun no it wasn't fun for her it was stressful yeah, yeah. And it was stressful for her and i could see it yeah. and so that's why i stopped taking her out she i did not take her out for holiday gatherings because it, it was again too stressful for her you yeah. know, and when she didn't recognize anyone, it would just be confusing to be in a room full of people you don't recognize. Yeah. And, you know, the people at her facility, she knew them better because they were there yeah. day in and day out. Now, even though she didn't recognize me as her daughter, she still remembered that she had a daughter named Cameron and she would talk about me. Sometimes she would talk about her daughter, Cameron, in my presence, yeah. uh, which was interesting. But. <laughs> yeah. But I know that even though she didn't recognize me, and I, 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 I really know this, that she still knew when I was there that I was someone who loved her and cared about her. And the reason I know this is she had this moment of lucidity. Oh, probably it was probably in the winter of 2019 before the pandemic started. And I was with her and we were walking around her facility and she said to me, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. And I said, well, let's get you to your room so you can lie down and I help her get in bed. And then she looks at me and she says, thank you for everything you do. I always see love in you. She had mm. not said anything that coherently to me in a long time. And I almost felt this, and no, I didn't almost, I felt this sense of panic thinking, oh my gosh, is my mother going to die? Because you hear about people having these moments of lucidity yep. as they are about to die. And so that rest, the rest of the afternoon, I thought I was going to get a call from her facility. I did not, I did not, but it was, it's something I carry with me still. Oh yeah. Knowing Absolutely. that she, she could see that I was someone who loved her and cared about her, even though she didn't yeah. recognize me as her daughter. Mm. Mm. That's Man, beautiful. I, you know what? I, I love this. Hey ladies, I need to interrupt for just a second to share about the sisterhood membership. It's basically a sale every day. And the best part, it's free. Here's the details. We're partnering with our friends at Benefit Hub and other care partners to save you money. With over 200,000 participating companies across the U.S. and abroad, you'll find discounts at your favorite local stores, huge savings on vacations, amazing deals on home, auto, and supplemental insurances, and everything in between. Go to confessionsofareluctantcaregiver.com to sign up, and then definitely tell your friends about it. They can join too. Trust me, there's a discount for everyone. And don't forget, it's free. Okay, back to confessing. Yeah. Go ahead, Jay. Well, no, and I know that, you know, I know that you, in all that you do, Cameron, I know, and at the last times, the, the time that we spoke before, that you made sure, and I want, we are definitely going to have you back. I think that's a key because I know, right? there's so many things that I want to make sure that we share with our listeners like dig about more. the financial planning portion of it, because yeah. that is something, you know, Natalie and I've talked about it and we've shared with people, we were ill prepared with mom. We just basically were not prepared. There's with no mom with anything. Jason. No, I wasn't prepared. Jason no. and I weren't prepared and we're younger. And yeah. so whether it's with your mom or with your spouse right. or with anyone that you love, I think that you can't think about it as right. an aging issue. I think you think about it's it as care. a, I plan for an, the unexpected. Right. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm going to plan as much as I can. Yeah. But with that said, I, you know, I look at a lot of the people that we've talked to and and just doing your absolute best. And with your mom being able to say that, you know, I know that you're someone that loves me. Um, I think that's all any of us can ask for. I mean, that just, you know, that's like a gift because um, you can't take that away. So, yeah, it was. So, Natalie, would you I like think to? It's, I think it's time, Jack. You have to ask first. Are you ready, Cameron, for a sister question? No, I'm yes. I'm asking second. I'm asking second because you know my favorite question. And oh, I get that's it. Like, sh- suck it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Cameron. I always <laughs> Jason and I will sometimes say suck it. And so <laughs> you're going first, Missy. Welcome everybody okay. to the All LAS. Right. Okay, Cameron. So uh, this is uh, probably, I mean, it's probably an easy one. Well, maybe it's an easy one for you. I don't know. So what do you think out of all those times when you were like, I am struggling here those days, what's the one thing that got you through those times? Mm. Something that helped you just kind of pick you back up and say, I can make it. (laughs) Um, Honestly, it was that feeling that I had no other choice. I think one thing that really benefited me through all of this is that I didn't, I didn't dwell on the negative side of the situation. Mm, I didn't think of myself as a victim. I didn't think, oh my gosh, you know, how could my mom do this to me? It wasn't her fault. Yeah, it was an awful situation, but she wasn't to blame. And I had to just think, you know, this, it is what it is. I would tell myself that all the time. It is what it is. And I'm just going to deal with it. I'm not going to complain about how bad it is. I'm not going to sit here and think about how bad it is. I'm just going focus. to, I'm just going to deal with what comes my way and plan as much as I can. Yeah. Um, and the planning helps the planning. It really does. Yeah. It does help because the more you plan, the easier it is to respond to those emergency situations and you're responding rationally as opposed to emotionally, you know, and that really helped me at the very end with my mother because she did contract COVID and she wasn't allowed to remain in her facility. And so I had to bring her to my home Um, and I had a plan, um, but no amount of planning is going to prepare you for, you know, watching a parent die. But having a plan in place made it a little bit easier. So, yeah, but just not dwelling on how bad the situation was got me through it. Would you say that if I get to ask another question, then do it, girl, do it. Since Emily's not here, I get to ask Emily's question. So if you could share one thing with the people, with the, all my listeners, my millions of listeners, there's millions, there's millions out there. Would you, would you say that that portion that just to lay it out and say, plan, make sure that you have your plan in place. Is that one of the things that you can't preach enough? Or what is that one thing that you would tell somebody? It's a must haves. Like Uh, you must must have, what what is it, Cameron? Planning is so important. You know, really we should all have a plan for the worst case scenario. Yeah. And then hope for the best. Um, Planning is so important, but also this is something I was so bad about. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Everybody I'm, says that. Everybody. I, I didn't hate ask for help. asking for help. Me too. I hate it. Hashtag. Like, okay, I did realize I needed help. And that is why I made that very difficult decision to move her into memory care. But, you know, when there were those emergencies, I was like, I got this. I can handle it. I don't need anyone to help me. Um, and so, and I didn't have people volunteering either to help. So yeah. it wasn't like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Run into your door. Down my door. No, 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 no. My mom's friends weren't lining up to, to help. Um, and she, you know, she, she had a great friend group, but um, I guess they had their own thing to do. Yeah. But yeah, because people don't know that you need help unless yeah. you let them know because they're like, oh, look at her. She's on top of it. Look at that. She's juggling a job and kids and her mom. She's got it under control. Yeah. No. You're like, no. <laughs> no. I'm going to tell right. you. I, All right. I, I I'll totally turn, I, I, I'll turn her over to you now, Natalie. I got two questions. All right, Natalie, it's your turn. She's got it under control. I, I'm going to tell you. And honestly, Cameron, I'm the best faker ever. Like I'm sitting here just <laughs> faking it until I make it. I just love that you said that. Cause I can tell you, I look like I had it totally under control. And on the inside, I'm like, somebody's going to figure me out. 
<laughs> somebody's going to call my bluff and be like, what about this? And I'll be like, and I melted. <laughs> so, okay. So here is the favorite sister question. We love all of our questions. This is the sure. best. We want to know what is your favorite guilty pleasure? Oh gosh. Right. Okay. Everybody's is different. Wine. It's wine. Ah! It's wine. What's your flavor? <laughs> I'm a white wine drinker because okay. red wine is more likely to give me a headache. But, uh, but, but fair but, enough. I am like, I'm like, you know what? I am I'm I'm trying to like, you know, kick the to to not drink. <laughs> Only on special occasions. <laughs> Only on special occasions, you know, because it you know, I, I think a lot of times we turn to those guilty pleasures too often we, when we are in a caregiving role because we're like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, today was so bad. I just need to whatever, eat some more chocolate or have that glass of wine or right. binge watch Netflix, which you can do if you're a caregiver, mm -hmm. you don't have time to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, or whatever, eat a whole bag of chips and queso or whatever it is it's it's very easy when you are a caregiver to make that excuse on a regular basis mm -hmm. to indulge in your guilty pleasures and before long you know those guilty pleasures become too much of a habit and you've gained 20 pounds or whatever True. understood <laughs> you are totally gaining some weight when you're shrill and stressed yeah oh, absolutely yes. oh yeah Yes. But so under, it, was, under the it right... was my guilty pleasure. And so now I got to like find a new guilty pleasure. I gotcha. <laughs> so under the right circumstances, you'll have a glass of white wine is yes. what you're saying. That's yes. your, okay. We'll take that. We'll to take that. Celebrate a special occasion or something. Got it. Got it. I love it. Well, when you it. air, when your podcast airs, we expect you to be having a glass of wine because absolutely, miss. we have so appreciated having you all the resources that you have shared with us, Cameron, yeah. we're going to make sure that we get those up uh, updated on our website uh, resource guide. And then also we have a library of suggested books on our benefits site. And we are going to make sure also that that, oh, wait a minute, Natalie's got it back. Look at her. She's pulling it. Uh, we're also going to make sure that that's in our, uh, oh, look at, there it is. We're also going to make sure it's, oh, there you I, go. I can't uh, hear, which makes it awesome. Here's oh, the book. <laughs> I, I took out the thingy. That, that's Cameron's book. And we're also going to make sure that that's in our library on our benefits site um, and tell everybody where they can purchase that as well. So, uh, but we cannot thank you for uh, being on with us today and sharing your story. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. Bye.